My entire to-do list revolved around Joe Johnson. I didn't have time to think about anything else. That's because I was cornered by two key constraints. Six years after Johnson started demanding that his lawsuit be removed from plain sight, Think Computer Corporation was suddenly required to show up in court on the other side of the country represented by an attorney, and I had barely any time to make that happen. From Think Press and Plain Sight, this is Broken, a podcast about what we like to call the rule of law, and how in the United States, there isn't one. We'll talk about all aspects of the legal system through the lens of Plain Sight, a legal and financial research platform where you can find information about things like lawsuits, lawyers, companies, and judges. On Plain Sight, anyone can read anything the government produces for free with no account. It really does put the world's complexity in plain sight. And that complexity was starting to really bug me, even as someone immersed in it for years. It's one thing to read about or study litigation. It's another to be in the thick of it. And I was in the thick of it in a place that every lawyer I talked to kept telling me I really didn't want to be. A judge in a small state court on the East Coast might have assumed that the CEO of a company in Silicon Valley with Computer Corporation in the name could just snap their fingers and have the best lawyers in the country appear in any courtroom nationwide, no problem. But ever since 2011, Think Computer Corporation was really just me, and somehow, when I snapped, no lawyers magically appeared. Although it had had an office, employees, and a promising future in the payment space before that, Those days came to an abrupt halt when lawyers for the giants of the payments industry succeeded in quietly changing the law in California, making it impossible for startups like mine to gain a foothold, while also stomping on any feet that had. A California Department of Financial Institutions bureaucrat, himself a lawyer, threatened me with jail time if I continued operating the same payments business that had been perfectly legal days before, in which I had spent years and a lot of money building. I hadn't exactly held a high opinion of lawyers before the Money Services Roundtable destroyed my payment startup, and after that, let's say that affair didn't help. To counter the efforts of the lawyers changing the law and the lawyer threatening me with jail, I hired a lawyer who failed to mention that he didn't know how to use word processing software and charged Think about $50,000 for representation that ended up being highly ineffective. Then I learned he had a record of stealing his clients' houses from under them by overbilling. I paid half his bill and reported him to the California bar for glaring ethical violations. The bar, as per usual, did nothing. Joe Johnson's summons said that the company actually had 60 days to show up and respond in court. But that was 60 days from August 2, 2022, and due to the district court, circuit court weirdness, I hadn't actually received the complaint until September 6. So by that logic, I really had about three weeks. But nothing is straightforward in law, and on September 6th, what happened when that summons and complaint arrived was akin to a labyrinth designed by M.C. Escher falling out of the sky and surrounding me on all sides, daring me to escape. Maryland's 60 days from the date of the summons deadline didn't actually matter, because from the moment I read the complaint, I knew that the strategy had to be to get to federal court as fast as possible, but the deadline was 30 days from the date I received the complaint, weeks after the summons was dated. 30 days might seem like a lot, but with the typical ebb and flow of the work week, people are out of the office, they can't take your call right now, emails get lost in the shuffle, there needs to be a meeting to decide that, it's actually not that much time at all. Moreover, this wasn't one of those 30-day deadlines in law that could be extended and extended ad infinitum. This deadline was solid, written directly into a federal law, totally inflexible and absolute. If you missed it, you were toast. So I had until early October to find a lawyer. And not just any lawyer, a lawyer who is licensed to practice law in Maryland. And not just any lawyer licensed to practice in Maryland, a litigator, reasonably close to, if not in, Prince George's County. Prince George's County turns out to be anything but the capital of business litigation, which means there are not many lawyers there who are used to litigating constitutional issues for companies. 
I think the number may actually be zero. Drunk driving, no problem. Bail issues, sure. But the Maryland Personal Information Protection Act, good luck. Finding a good lawyer is always a challenge, but this seemed especially difficult, even with my giant database of lawyers nationwide. Many people don't realize that lawyers are incredibly specialized. There are so-called transactional lawyers who just write contracts all day or review government filings for mergers and acquisitions. Silicon Valley is full of them. They never see the inside of a courtroom. Then there are lobbyists who spend their days in places like Sacramento or Columbus or Washington, D.C. They also have very little to do with courts. And then there are civil litigators who fight out battles between individuals or businesses. But there's also criminal attorneys, prosecutors, probate lawyers. You can't just expect any attorney you call to be able to help with your problem. I needed a business litigator who ideally didn't have to drive an hour just to get to Upper Marlboro. But even litigators are specialized. Just like you wouldn't call a podiatrist for problems involving your heart, you won't get very far with an antitrust attorney in a personal injury case. I needed a Maryland litigator specializing in First Amendment law. In Washington, D.C., where First Amendment cases are heard in the courts every day of the week, that might not be so hard. But in Maryland, I was hitting a brick wall. And yet, even if I got the perfect Maryland lawyer on the phone somehow, I didn't exactly know what to tell them yet. I had to do more research on this Joe Johnson character. So naturally, I typed his name into plain sight, and I already knew I had a problem, the disambiguation problem. I had spent a lot of time, years, working on the disambiguation problem as it applies to law firms. Disambiguation is the process of separating out things that are similar or ambiguous, like law firms. When you think about it, it's kind of impossible to define what a law firm is in a discrete sense. If today it's Thomas, Jones, and Shapiro LLP, and then Jones leaves, is Thomas and Shapiro LLP the same law firm? Jones might have left to start her own or joined another firm, or maybe her firm merged with another, my worst nightmare. So I'm not sure there's an answer to that question that you could say is correct. When you add that existential ambiguity to the fact that court and government clerks have typed in law firm names incorrectly by mistake for decades, it gets dicey. Not every name is so easy to spell. There are law firms that have hundreds of incorrect spellings in official data. Merging all of that data is a chore, and again, often, there's no correct answer. It's not something you can expect AI to solve for you. Here, the issue wasn't the name of the law firm involved in a case. It was the name of the party. Joe Johnson is about as generic a name as one can imagine in America. Maybe John Smith is more generic, but not by much. According to the Social Security Administration, the most common male legal first name of the past 100 years is James, followed by Michael and Robert. John is number four. Joseph is number eight. Believe it or not, Aaron is number 52 on the list, and Joe is 84. But I don't think that accounts for the fact that a lot of Josephs actually go by Joe. Suffice it to say, Joe is pretty popular. There have been about 2.3 million Josephs in the United States over the past century, plus another 365,000 Joes. As for the last name I was interested in, according to Wikipedia, Johnson is the second most common surname in the United States behind Smith. In the 2000 census, there were nearly 1.9 million Johnsons. And here I was, trying to figure out the deal with Joe Johnson. There were some weeds to go on, however. I started with the case he had written in about, Johnson v. Ashmore, to try to get a sense of the issue that he found concerning enough to sue over. The complaint said that it was a lawsuit about another lawsuit, in which a settlement agreement with Xerox fell through. That made the lawsuit I was dealing with, the one against Think, a lawsuit about a lawsuit about a lawsuit. Why was Johnson in litigation with Xerox? Well, Xerox had purchased an IT contractor called ACS, and one of ACS's lines of business was processing student loans. Apparently, Johnson had had some sort of issue with a loan. As a result, Johnson in Maryland had sued Xerox's lawyers in Texas for breach of implied warranty of authority, fraud and intentional misrepresentation, negligence, fraud and fraudulent misrepresentation again, conspiracy to commit fraud, and intentional infliction of emotional distress. He asked for $75,000, which is the statutory minimum amount of money necessary to file a civil case in federal court with diversity jurisdiction, 
meaning that all of the parties are in different states. The case didn't go well for Joe. He amended or updated his complaint about a month after he filed it in late July 2015. Xerox lawyers motioned to dismiss the case, and they got their wish. The case was dismissed in June 2016. But Johnson was persistent. He appealed the dismissal to the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit in July. That was two months before he first filled out the Plain Sight Contact Us form, which meant that when he did, there was an appeal pending that he didn't mention. The appeal was decided in March 2017. Johnson lost. Here's what the judges on the appellate panel wrote. Quote, This is a lawsuit about a lawsuit. The chain of litigation began when Joseph Johnson sued Allison Ashmore and Craig Bunder's former clients, Affiliated Computer Services Incorporated and ACS Education Solutions LLC in the Northern District of Texas. That suit was over a dispute about the processing of Johnson's student loans. While a motion to dismiss was pending, Johnson, proceeding pro se, and Ashmore discussed a settlement. The two signed a letter outlining the terms in which Johnson would receive $10,950 and in exchange would release his claims and dismiss the lawsuit. Before that settlement was finalized, however, the district court granted the defendant's motion to dismiss and entered a final judgment against Johnson. Johnson then unsuccessfully sought relief from judgment under Rule 60B. Johnson next turned his attention to the courts of his home state of Maryland, where he filed suit against Ashmore and her clients alleging, among other things, fraud, tortious interference, negligent misrepresentation, and breach of contract. The Maryland court dismissed the claim against Ashmore for want of personal jurisdiction, and the claim against the clients as barred by res judicata based on the ruling against Johnson on his Rule 60B motion in the first lawsuit. Johnson then went back to the Northern District of Texas to file this suit against Ashmore and Budner. He asserted a number of claims, including that the two attorneys breached their implied warranty of authority as agents for their clients. The attorneys moved to dismiss, arguing res judicata, collateral estoppel, and attorney immunity from suit for actions undertaken while representing their clients. Speaking to res judicata alone, the district court granted the motion to dismiss and Johnson appealed." End quote. The opinion goes on to discuss immunity for attorneys, but already I was alarmed. This guy seemed to file a lot of litigation. How much of that litigation was indexed on plain sight, I wondered? And could it tell me anything useful in handling Johnson's case against Think? Searching the Maryland Judiciary Case Search website for Joe Johnson yielded hundreds of results, which wasn't helpful. But the site allowed me to sort the results by the date each case was filed. This yielded the startling piece of information that on July 20th, 2022, the day that Think's case was transferred to the Circuit Court of Prince George's County, someone named Joe Johnson had also filed two other lawsuits, one against Barclay Bank Delaware and another against a company called Original Media Group Corporation. My case number was Cal 22 21998 but it seemed that 21996 and 21997 were also Johnson cases. This was totally wild. It's one thing to file a frivolous lawsuit. It's an entirely different thing to file a frivolous lawsuit as part of a three-pack, like you're ordering burgers at McDonald's for yourself and some friends. This was the kind of thing that only a vexatious litigant would do. The term vexatious litigant isn't just a fancy turn of phrase I came up with. It's a legal term of art, which refers to someone who files bogus lawsuits one after another. These people exist, and they are a scourge on the legal system. Some, but not all, suffer from mental illness. Fortunately, some states, such as California, have recognized the problem and passed laws to address vexatious litigation, making it illegal to file a lawsuit without prior authorization once you're on a list that is shared across all county courts. Court clerks know to consult the list before allowing a plaintiff to file. Some federal courts do this as well. Other states and federal courts don't have laws or rules on the books about vexatious litigation at all. Maryland is one of those states. Now that I had some sense of who I was dealing with, a vexatious litigant running wild in a state with no oversight, I wondered how bad the problem really was. It was an important question to answer because Think's response in court would be much more convincing if the judge could actually see the depth of the issue. Had Johnson filed just those three lawsuits on July 20th, or 10, 20, 50? How long had he been at it? I went back to the Maryland Judiciary Case Search website since it seemed like Prince George's County was Johnson's preferred jurisdiction. 
Searching for Joe Johnson or Joseph Johnson led to a lot of results, but it was impossible to tell which Joes and Josephs were him versus who was someone else with the same name. Plus, based on the contact us form, I already knew that some of his cases were filed in federal court, and not even in Maryland necessarily, since Johnson v. Ashmore was filed in Texas. I did have one piece of information that I knew I could use to disambiguate the results, his mailing address. That P.O. box in Fort Washington, Maryland, probably wasn't shared with anyone else, and certainly not with another person having the exact same name. Much to my amazement, the Maryland Judiciary Case Search website listed the party's mailing address on most of the civil cases I looked at in Prince George's County. Many court systems don't list a party's address. Frankly, it was the least Maryland could do, because I quickly realized that I was at a massive disadvantage. It was bad enough that I needed to hire an attorney to represent the company, and it was even worse that Prince George's County was still stuck on paper as opposed to electronic filing until October 2022. But even some jurisdictions using paper documents have the smarts to scan them in. Not Maryland. The court rules in Maryland dictated that the public was not entitled to view court documents online. Only the attorneys or parties to a specific case were allowed to do that but that required electronic filing to have been implemented. Until October 2022, Prince George's County was an informational black hole. Even then, the court would only begin the process of scanning documents starting from 2022 onward in whichever sporadic older cases they needed to. This was a real problem. My adversary had full access to everything he could possibly want to know about me. All of my litigation and my company's litigation was available on plain sight, for anyone to view free of charge. That was, after all, the whole point. But in order for me to really get a sense of Joe Johnson's history, I would literally have to fly to Maryland and hunker down in a records room inside the court building if the records were even available. There was a good chance that they weren't and that they'd have to be ordered from some warehouse. I was fighting a ghost. I didn't particularly feel like flying to Maryland, so I kept on looking through every Joe or Joseph Johnson case I could find. The P.O. box yielded two crucial pieces of information. It was linked to a lot of cases where my Joe Johnson used the middle initial R and the suffix Jr., so he was really Joseph R. Johnson Jr. Now we were getting somewhere. There seemed to be an awful lot of cases associated with the name, far more than I expected, enough to raise one eyebrow and then the other. Could there be more than one person with that name in Prince George's County, Maryland? It wasn't impossible. Once I felt like I had a decent idea of who Joe Johnson was, at least well enough that I could describe the situation to someone. I started calling and emailing every lawyer and legal aid group I could find in Maryland who I thought looked like they had some chance of being able to help. I wrote to the Reporters Committee for the Freedom of the Press. I called Georgetown Law's Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection. Neither was interested in offering any help. I called the ACLU again and again, trying to get through. I also wrote to a friend from high school who had ended up as a partner at a major firm in Baltimore. He responded quickly, but made it clear that despite the First Amendment interests in the case, and despite the fact that law firms like his depended upon access to legal resources, what I was talking about was not pro bono material. As he wrote to me, quote, I can certainly see how low they'd approve rate-wise, and I'm also happy to try to find another firm with lower rates, and I have some ideas, but again, I wouldn't hold your breath for someone to handle it pro bono, unfortunately. This was not what I was hoping to hear. Most law firms have a pro bono practice where they try to give back to the community by taking on cases of legal significance free of charge. I thought that this one at least had a shot. Allowing there to be precedent on the books stating that if vexatious litigants could just sue enough, they could erase records of their cases, that sounded pretty bad. Not to mention the allegation that I should have asked Joe Johnson's permission before publishing his name on a public record because he considered his name personal identifying information. Think of what a law like HIPAA has done to healthcare in the United States. That point alone would cause the total collapse of the legal system as we know it. Aside from my friend, there were, of course, plenty of other lawyers in Maryland. I thought that maybe some of the lawyers who knew Joe Johnson best, the ones who had already litigated against him, might be able to help. At least I could be fairly certain that they or their colleagues were licensed to practice law in Maryland. So I pulled up the Maryland Judiciary Case Search website again. I was getting pretty familiar with it by this point. I fired off an email to Matthew Skipper. The Maryland Judiciary listed him under Attorney Information for Exactus LLC, a defendant in a lawsuit Johnson had filed in May 2019. Mr. Skipper, I wrote, 
My company was recently sued by Joseph Joe R. Johnson Jr., who appears to be a prolific, vexatious litigant. Based on the docket in Johnson v. Exactus LLC, case number CAL 19-17237, it seems like you are probably familiar with him. Would you be willing to speak on the phone briefly about your experience litigating against Mr. Johnson? I never heard back. This all happened on September 8, 2022, two days after I received Johnson's complaint from Think's mail forwarding service. While I was calling and emailing, I was also updating Plainsight's database with information I was learning from the Maryland judiciary, building up a profile on Joseph R. Johnson Jr. What started with Johnson versus Ashmore et al. soon looked like it would be approaching 25 dockets, maybe more. On September 9th, it occurred to me that maybe there was a small chance that there was no need to fight this lawsuit at all. Even though Maryland didn't have a vexatious litigant statute, that didn't mean that its courts particularly liked people who filed dozens of pointless cases. Usually, when a judge sees a handwritten complaint making claims about space aliens and mind control, the case gets booted automatically, without any hearings, through what's called an order to show cause. The particular flavor of that order in such a situation might be that the plaintiff is ordered to show cause as to why the case should not be dismissed. Johnson's complaint didn't have the kinds of red flags that would trigger such a response by the court, like illegible scrawling or nonsense claims, word salad, or hallmarks of schizophrenia. But I might be able to simply notify the court clerk of the situation and kick off a series of events that would at least lead to an investigation. I looked up Maryland precedent on vexatious litigants and found a case called Tinsley v. Townsend in the Maryland Court of Special Appeals. Now, this requires an aside to explain that the Court of Special Appeals was what Maryland used to call its appellate court. And to make matters more confusing, it also used to call its Supreme Court the Maryland Court of Appeals, without the word special. Finally, Maryland ditched all of that and started using sensible names for its courts in November 2022. Meanwhile, Tinsley v. Townsend, the appellate case, was about a vexatious litigant who argued that they didn't have due process before being declared vexatious in the lower court. So, the appellate court ruled that people who might be labeled vexatious deserved a hearing first, before such a designation was made. With this in mind, I wrote an email to the clerks of both the district and the circuit courts, briefly spelling out the evidence for why Joe Johnson, also known as Joseph R. Johnson Jr., appeared to be a vexatious litigant. And there were some compelling points I'd come across in my two days of research. According to the Maryland Judiciary Case Search website, Mr. Johnson had moved around a lot. He previously lived in Oxon Hill, Maryland, where Google Street View showed the building that he lived in to be a low-slung apartment complex with two or three floors. At some point, it looks like he moved from an apartment on the first floor to an apartment on a higher floor, which he described in writing to the court using the abbreviation PH. At first, I wasn't sure what this meant, but then I realized that he had spelled it out in other lawsuits he had filed, penthouse, as though he lived at the top of the Ritz-Carlton in a major city and not the upper floor in a rundown two or three-story building. I noticed that the PH abbreviation was on a few other addresses as well, none of which looked like the kinds of buildings that nearly had enough class to merit the top floor being called a penthouse. But who knows, maybe that's what the button said in the elevator and he decided to use it to his advantage. Mr. Johnson might have been in DC for a short time. It was hard to tell if the one lawsuit that had a DC PO box was actually the same Joe Johnson. Eventually, he moved to an apartment in Fort Washington. Then he got a PO box there and he used that for most of his litigation. But before he lived in all of these places, he lived somewhere else. Federal prison. And before that, state prison. He never wrote the words prison or jail in his address. Johnson found clever ways to mask the fact that he was a prisoner, writing out his mailing address using his penitentiary's street address and his prisoner register number as though it were an apartment. I saw him do this with his P.O. box as well and a few legal documents, writing out the mailing address for the post office itself with his P.O. box described as a unit at that address, the odd apartment with a six-digit number, suggesting a million residences in a single building. This helped him circumvent rules that required that he disclose the physical address where he actually lived. It didn't entirely surprise me that I was dealing with another criminal, but I also thought for the first time that maybe there was more to this situation than simply a bunch of garbage claims written on a page in fluent but grammatically and orthographically imperfect legalese. I quickly summarized everything I'd learned in this email to the court clerks. I wanted it to be extremely clear that this wasn't just a hunch, that there was concrete evidence that Joe Johnson had been abusing their court system. It was the kind of thing I hoped they'd take personally. What clerk of court wants to be caught having let this kind of thing happen under their watch? And the number of cases I'd found kept growing.
I realized that one of the best ways to ensure that the clerks knew exactly which Joe Johnson I was talking about, because I didn't want to create any additional confusion, was to identify him by date of birth. And thanks to some of the filings in his criminal cases that I had found, I actually knew that piece of information, May 31st. I made sure to include that data point in the email. Then I had to figure out exactly who to send it to. On the two line, I put the general email address for the clerk of court of the circuit court for Prince George's County. Then I cc'd a few email addresses I was told over the phone, including the assistant to James E. Watson, the manager of the civil division, and Nancy Faulkner, the court administrator of the circuit court. I also cc'd the federal prosecutor in one of Johnson's criminal cases, Linwood C. Wright Jr., and the lawyer for Exactus LLC I had contacted before, Matthew Skipper. Then I BCC'd my high school friend, who was the law partner in Baltimore considering taking on the case, and my father, who is technically on Think's board of directors. Basically, I wanted everyone to know exactly what was going on. Back in June 2022, when criminal number two filed his lawsuit against Plainside and the rest of the internet over the publication of his other lawsuit involving his unpaid taxes, I'd contacted the Electronic Frontier Foundation to see if they knew anybody who could help defend the case in Cuyahoga County, Ohio, which is coincidentally where I grew up. The EFF is well known for defending civil liberties online, including freedom of speech. It maintains a mailing list for legal emergencies like the one I had been facing. Though it didn't produce any leads in June, I was eventually able to find lawyers in my hometown to fend off the crazy case. Now, three months later, I wasn't having much luck finding lawyers to take this on, so out of an abundance of caution, I decided to go back to the EFF to ask for help with another legal emergency. I contacted them on September 9th, but I still had a nagging feeling that I hadn't done everything I could to stop this in its tracks. On September 12th, my request for legal assistance went out to the EFF mailing list. At that point, all I could do was wait. I had 23 days to figure this all out. But I couldn't just wait. I had to do something. On the phone, the clerk staff had told me that only a judge could really do anything about the problem I was describing. So on September 13th, 2022, I also left a voicemail for the administrative judge of the Circuit Court of Prince George's County, Sheila R. Tillerson Adams, explaining the situation. Hello. You have reached the chambers of the Honorable Sheila R. Tillerson Adams, Chief and Administrative Judge for Prince George's County and the 7th Judicial Circuit of Maryland. Sorry we missed your call. However, if you wish to leave a message, please do so. Thank you and have a nice day. Record your message after the tone. When you've finished, you can hang up or press 1 for more options. Hi, my name is Aaron Greenspan. I'm calling from Think Computer Corporation in San Francisco, California. And I had called the clerk's office to inquire about any procedures that may be in place in your court system regarding vexatious litigants because it's come to my attention that there is an individual in Prince George's County who has sued somewhere on the order of 100 times in both the district court, I believe, and the circuit court, uh, just one lawsuit after another against you know, everyone from Microsoft to former attorneys he's in, you know, been involved with. And now, um, you know, my company is one of these defendants as of a few weeks ago, I guess, uh, that he's going after. I've never met the man. Um, the, the claims are frivolous and I, you know, will defend the company in court as appropriate. But in the meantime, I think it's important that your court be aware that this is happening and that you take some action to mitigate future abuses of your court system. Um, the individual's name is Joseph R. Johnson Jr. He uses a variety of different names as it suits him, I think. And um, I'd be happy to give you more detail if you're interested. I understand that you can't do anything about my particular case unless it's you know done as part of the full record. That's not my purpose with this call. My purpose is just to inform you that this man is a vexatious litigant and you should hopefully take some action to prevent future abuses. Uh, thank you very much. Bye. I kept calling law firms in Maryland and talking to anyone I could. Then, on September 19th, I received an email that was, in a word, terrifying. My high school friend got back to me with an estimate of what his firm would charge to represent my company. We'd known each other since sixth grade. I was hoping for something in the $5,000 range, maybe $10,000. On the low end, the estimate in a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet called for $27,425 of billable time. 
on the high end, $92,025. My friend's rate was quoted at $515 per hour. Since he was a partner, I'm guessing that was a hefty discount. But if it wasn't already obvious, lawyers are very, very expensive. I should point out here, litigation doesn't make me nervous. I've been through enough and I've learned enough about the system that I no longer have the pangs of anxiety from not understanding what I'm dealing with that I think unfortunately afflict a lot of people who have to wade through the muddy waters of the legal system. But this spreadsheet made me nervous. I didn't have a $92,000 legal budget to spend on a criminal trying to drag me into court in another state. As an entrepreneur running a tiny company that had done absolutely nothing wrong, I was a victim here. The offender was a convict. The legal profession, as per usual, was well aware of all of that, and its immediate and only response was to try to victimize me further. There had to be another option, I thought. So I made more calls and I wrote more emails. As the hours ticked by and the days passed, I was growing increasingly worried. A default judgment, what happens when you forfeit a lawsuit by failing to show in the manner the court requires, would be an extremely bad outcome. To start with, the plaintiff was demanding $25,000, but he wanted punitive damages as well. The price of failure was steep. There was one way I thought I might be able to buy time. Due to local rules in each federal court put there by lawyers, individuals aren't allowed to represent corporations who are considered separate persons unless they are members of the bar. Since I wasn't a lawyer, I couldn't represent Think in Court, making this a crisis entirely manufactured by lawyers in order to line their own pockets. I found this particularly irksome because Think is what's called a subchapter S corporation, meaning that its taxes pass through to my personal return. Since I own 100% of the company, every penny of tax that Think owes is actually tax that I personally pay. So the notion that in court, I have to treat the company as some separate entity that I cannot represent, well, it feels a lot like taxation without representation. But those were the rules, and my attempt to challenge them, along with the PACER fee structure, hadn't gone as well as I'd hoped. But what if Johnson had sued the wrong party? I could make a credible argument that he'd included a photo of me in his email threatening to sue, and my name was on the line in the address block where he put the word serve. Maybe, while we were arguing about whether I was right or wrong, I'd have more time to at least find an attorney for the company, at which point the argument would be moot anyway. I went back and forth on whether it was worth the effort. It might annoy the judge. On the other hand, what was better, an annoyed judge or losing outright? The judge would probably be annoyed by an unrepresented corporation anyway. On September 19th, I had 16 days left before the company and I were in real trouble. My calls and emails had gone nowhere. No one wanted to donate their precious time to a small business bleeding out on the street, even if that small business did some nice things for the community. There were much bigger and more important cases to worry about. I decided to drop the paperwork to, quote, remove, the legal term for transfer, the case to federal court. What that actually meant was drafting something called a notice of removal, which certified that everyone involved in the case was a citizen of a different state and that the dispute exceeded $75,000. I was arguing that Think Computer Corporation had been sued in error, that I, Aaron Greenspan, the correct defendant, was a citizen of California, and that Joe Johnson was a citizen of Maryland. The complaint asked for $25,000 in damages, but since punitive damages could be two to three times the compensatory damages, the case could theoretically have been worth $75,000. At least, that's what a lawyer from a major firm, which wouldn't help, told me as I was sitting on the steps outside my dentist's office, taking calls from anyone in Maryland who even knew what a notice of removal was and was willing to call me back. The next day, I decided I couldn't risk not giving it a try. I had no lawyer lined up and only 15 days to find one. Since I wasn't allowed to file new cases electronically in federal court as a pro se litigant, The local rules of each federal court required, and still require, pro se litigants to ask judges permission to use a computer. I put the papers in a priority mail envelope and nervously sent them on their way. I also had to send a copy to the state court in Prince George's County, actually entitled, A Notice of Notice of Removal, so that it knew that the case was no longer in its jurisdiction. This handoff between courts is always about as legally prickly as things get, because it touches on issues of federal versus state power, which is an issue at the heart of the United States Constitution. If you forget any detail, any at all, the whole process turns into a giant mess and may not work. With this in mind, I wondered, would the clerk in Baltimore docket the case as Johnson versus Aaron Greenspan, as I argued it should have been filed, or Johnson versus Think? 
I went to sleep not knowing and very worried. I woke up the next morning to an email from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Hi, Aaron, it said. I'm very sorry for the long delay here. Please reach out to Paul Levy at Public Citizen with Paul's email address. He's interested in speaking with you. I'll let you know if we have any other referrals. Best, Haley, Legal Intake Coordinator. I couldn't believe it. Someone had actually responded. I wasted no time in getting in touch with Paul. Though I wasn't at that point familiar with his work litigating on behalf of parties in First Amendment cases, I soon learned that he was something of a legend in the field, and I had certainly heard of Public Citizen. It was a nonprofit organization in Washington, D.C. that had originally been founded by Ralph Nader. It did good work. I explained the case to Paul, told him about the removal papers that were still in the mail, he wasn't very happy to hear about that, and explained how ridiculously small my company was. In a voice that made clear that he was senior to me in every respect, he seemed concerned that I might be trying to take advantage of a nonprofit such as Public Citizen with limited resources. I assured him that I did not have the $92,000 budget my friend had quoted me to defend the case myself. He wanted documents to prove it. I sent them over. At first, on the phone, Paul merely hinted that he might be interested, with an emphasis on might. But after our phone call, his quick responses by email made clear that he was. He agreed that federal court was the way to go and wanted to get the removal process smoothed out as soon as possible. There was just one problem. Paul couldn't practice in Maryland. He was licensed as an attorney in D.C. But then, on the following day, there was more good news. Oliver Edwards, a Maryland intellectual property attorney, was also interested in helping out. I put him in touch with Paul. Before long, we all reached an agreement. Paul would be the lead counsel on the case, with Oliver serving as local counsel in Maryland, in state or federal court as needed. Oliver wouldn't be doing most of the heavy lifting, but he'd be glad to be involved as long as public citizen was. And contrary to my friend's warning, they were willing to work pro bono. While Think would have to pay costs, like postage and court fees, there would be no hourly billing to worry about. I was thrilled, for a few days anyway. I knew that there was a lot of work ahead of us to get the right words before the right judge at the right time. But what I didn't know was just how sophisticated an adversary we were facing, or how well he had mapped out the flaws in the system. It didn't take long before I actually heard the dreaded words. And that soft, pleasant voice, with a little help from the federal government, turned my world upside down. Broken is produced by Think Press and Plainsight, which are both brought to you by Think Computer Corporation. Everything you hear or see on this podcast, the script, the sound design, the mixing, the graphic design, the music, the website, and the Dolly image prompting, that's my doing. Until next time, I'm Aaron Greenspan.